we will move on to the next session uh, my wound leaks post arthroplasty yeah thank you thank you that was an enthralling session we'll move on to the arthroplasty session uh, for the next session i'd like to it invite dr uh, subranchu mohanty and dr anup daman gaukar as conveners can i request everybody in the audience to download slido it's an app that's available on play store and uh, on android store slido will enable us to run real time audience polls s l i d o and once you download it wirock max w i r o c m a x uh, is the login password keyword i'll request uh, anup to take over yeah, so without much ado uh, let me welcome our chair persons for the session dr rajesh dharia and dr rakesh nair can we have uh, them on stage and for the panel let me invite our panelists dr unmesh majan dr sanjay londe dr rajkumar natesan and dr nikhil pradhan so they will be joining us shortly so please download uh, the slido app we'll be having some interesting polls on slido and we'll run them through the presentation so good morning dear friends who is changing the slides please don't change the slides please don't change the slides i will control okay good morning dear friends so we are running 5 minutes late now so we will be uh, trying to compensate it but uh, hopefully that we have prepared it for 45 minutes so we will be completing little late so as you know the most uh, you know dreaded complication after a arthroplasty is the leaking wound and that's what we are going to discuss it today because if you see the literature there is no uniformity of accepted definition of wound leakage that how you define that there is a it's a leaking wound and second point is that there is lack of evidence uh, based on the clinical guidelines for diagnosis and treatment of a leaking wound so there are two important things which is lacking in the literature that's why we are here with our experts so that we can throw you some guidelines on this but from the literature it is the wound is considered to be persistently leaking when it continues for more than 3 days after the index arthroplasty and it requires a surgical intervention probably if the leakage persists beyond 5 to 7 days however there is an you know international consensus meeting on infection which showed javed parvizi et al they have mentioned that persistent wound leakage as a wound is leaking more than 2 into 2 cm that means the dressing is soaked more than 2 into 2 cm for at least more than 3 days then you tell that the wound is leaking and one need to do a wound care bed rest pressure bandages and or, or antibiotics but the recommended that one should not inadvertently just uh, switch over and give a higher antibiotics they are against the use of antibiotics in a persistent wound leakage so this is the background knowledge in the literature based on that we have our experts today i am subhran sumanti from mumbai and along with me dr anup daman gaonkar he is the convener for this session we have dr nikhil pradhan uh, rather mr nikhil pradhan from uk consultant orthopedic surgeon nikhil is a good friend and uh, dr rajkumar from coimbatore all the way from ganga hospital dr unmesh mahajan from nagpur and uh, dr sanjay londe from mumbai so we have a expert of panelist here and we have two expert chair persons with us dr rakesh nair and dr rajesh dharia from mumbai to guide us and uh, to monitor in our presentations so now through the slido i don't know how far you are acquainted with the slido the first questions which i am going to ask all of you that why leaking wound is important leaking wound after tkr is associated with increased risk of wound infection decreased risk of wound infection no risk associated to wound infection and 100% risk of wound infection what you what we are worried about the infected total joint represent correct so leaking wound associated with uh, this one of this you have to select okay can we have the can we have this project we have please? 10 seconds to answer this if you are not acquainted with slido 
then can we raise your hands okay project that on screen please those who are in favor of uh, in option 1 no, the qr code just scan the qr code and you can just put in your poll or we can have a show of hands okay so it's pretty easy question just to you know warm you up that there is increased risk of wound infection that is why we are worried about leaking wounds next little difficult question you know as you know from the literature leaking wound delays in the discharge of the patient there is prolonged hospital bed occupancy it is frustrating for the patient as well as the family there is economic increase economic burden on healthcare and society and persistent wound oozing after joint arthroplasty has been shown to be associated with increased risk of infection so how to prevent you know to for the joint to go into the infection let's go to the second question which of the following is associated with less perioperative oozing after tcr less epidural anesthesia spinal anesthesia preemptive analgesia and periarticular anesthesia can you have the poll okay so 100% people tell that uh, you know okay okay <laughs> but if you th go through the literature the periarticular local anesthesia has got a less oozing of the own so subvastus approach periarticular local anesthesia and shorter tunicate time these are the three factors which are important for a less of wound oozing then we will go through the other factors let's go ahead with them presenting the cases so we'll discuss four cases here and the first case uh, i would invite dr anup to present the first case thank you sir uh, so the first case is a case of a 69 year old gentleman uh, he had presented uh, to me with a valgus laxney he was on demards uh, and he had got pain and instability more on the left so this was his uh, gait video so mind it that his ligaments are lax uh, with significant medial laxity he has got re recurvatum as well so his tissues are pretty lax so we went ahead and uh, uh, did a, a semi constraint design the lcck for him and this is his wound day 4 post op what would be your take on on the same so let me start with uh, dr sanjay londe day 4 the patient is home discharged as per definition more than 2 by 2 cm what do you do the the size of the wound is more than 2 by 2 cm yes and he's rheumatoid yes on demards and uh, he's getting a thromboprophylaxis also yes flexen or uh, rivaroxaban or something so so he was on apixaban and he was on demards that was continued some of which that we'll discuss as i mentioned he was preoperatively on leflunomide methotrexate and steroids and this is the first on the day 4 you are noticed yes this first. is day 4 post op the patient is home and he sends me this photograph with the soakage so obviously he needs to come back to you you need to personally yourself uh, examine the wound and uh, uh, i think the apart from the wound size and its characteristics the important thing to note is whether he has got a decreased range of motion of that particular joint suppose he was bending up to 90 or 100 degrees and if it is uh, bending less then obviously the the diagnosis is made for you clinical yes. sign and symptom <coughs> and if the wound is more than 2 by 2 i think by parvez's criteria you are almost obliged to take him to the theater paint and drape in a standard tkr fashion right. and go layer by layer wash it out and uh, right. take it from there what about dr mahajan we'll we'll take two at a time every, uh, every i case. think i won't go straight to theater first uh, if it's painful the important part is extreme pain sudden increase in pain loss of range and leaking wound one dressing is okay one or two dressing is not a bad thing i'll send even my fellow home get a dressing sorted out see how things after 48 hours 24 hours rest not too much of a exercise and see after 48 hours how things are and then i will see how things but pain is the most important factor that's right a painful very acute painful wound which is leaking needs to be sorted yes. out yes so this is an early discharge we we'll just move ahead and take questions as on as suggested <coughs> i i sent my uh, dresser home for dressing a trained uh, dresser with me but these are a few points that we would want to consider would you consider or incriminate demards uh, to the de uh, wound healing 
This patient had significant diffusion, if you have noted, preoperatively as well. Would you stop steroids? Uh, because these patients are known to flare up if they are not on steroid uh, post-operatively. Uh, my observation, there are two types of joints. One is a huge capacity inside. Once you open the thing, this large synovium is almost a half liter of fluid there. And one is very dry ones. Those with large joints, they always fill up eventually and ca can cause leakage. Right. And some people don't have at all those things. So those are the ones, but I think I won't stop DMAR more than 10 days. And steroids, yeah. I think they have to be given steroids because otherwise they're going to withdraw. So what is sorted out with the rheumatologist has to be done. Yes. W about uh, about DMARDs, Dr. Pradhan, Mr. Pradhan, what would you say? So I wouldn't stop any of your medication. None of them? Not None even? None of them. I would say that if you are dealing with these patients, operate with them without a tunique, so that you have hemostasis from the start. It's very difficult to get hemostasis once the implant is in. So I would say for these patients, start without a tunique, and then if you've caught all the bleeders to start with, you will have uh, less chances of a huge hematrosis. What Unmesh has said is absolutely right. But I think with that first case where you're seeing an opening, we do have a low threshold for you using what we call as a PICO dressing, which is a suction dressing, and that tends to keep the wound dry. Clinically, if you're not suspecting infection, you could give it a couple of days. But if you're suspecting infection, you're better off just going in. Right. So about DMARDs, uh, yeah, we be should... Before, before you move on, most important point is that, you know, what uh, panel is suggested, you will send the fellow, you send your dressure. Personally, I would like to check the wound myself. If you are a surgeon, you must call the patient, you check the wound because the assessment of the inflammation around the wound, you know, these are the critical assessment that whether to intervene, not to intervene, this is your decision. So, personally, I think a surgeon should check the wound. Yes, Just, please. just uh, uh, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, in this... First, when we see this kind of, first time when we note, as uh, he asked about the thromboprophylaxis, it is better to stop for a day or two and then see. And sometimes it slowly it comes down. So we should not jump Perfect. in and think Perfect. that it's an infection. And avoid flexion or active physio. Yeah. Yeah. So and put, him, the, put the patient on a knee brace, yes. avoid uh, movements, CPM, Perfect. all those things. Give some rest. Many a times it will settle down. Right. Right. So we move on about DMARDs. Understand that there is an increased risk of infection, therefore be aggressive in RA. Uh, post op flare ups are common. Methotrexate is given up now that we have to continue that. Leflunamide also we continue as an immunomodulator. Tocilizumab, it's worthwhile waiting for a month before surgery. Tofazdesinib, widely marketed and used these days to be stopped for seven days preoperatively. This is the latest literature. We come across SLE cases as well. Non severe ones, that's what we tackle with for uh, joint replacements. Tacrolimus and mycophenolate, uh, mycophenolate you withhold, whereas tacrolimus you can continue. Okay, so these are about uh, uh, the, the DMARDs. Uh, what about interoperative factors? We've discussed uh, the tourniquet. Uh, Dr. Dharia, what about the drain? Would you keep the drain in these patients because they have flare-ups? I was just going to ask you that. So, I was just, when did you remove the drain? Uh, it was third day. So, 48 hours and we removed How much it. was the... So first day, typically they throw up about 110 cc of of, uh, effuse, uh, of of drain. Next day, they go down to almost 30 to 40 cc. And third day, they have less than 15 cc. That's the typical pattern in, in RA that so I've seen. So that's what happened practice. in this case as yes, well. Yes, nothing that is, uh, special. We had a dry drain and then we removed it. Yeah, these are obviously one would keep a drain in such yes. patients. It is very mandatory to keep it and as monitor, you know, as you've done it. So, yes. That's a good Dr. Point. Nair, what about uh, anticoagulants? We have used Novax here. I don't use anticoagulants. So, in this case, I would say we would stop it anyway for a day or two. Right. And I wouldn't be very aggressive on the day four. On this, I would wait successive dressings and then take a watch and decide what to do next. Right. So, about tunique, we have decided that yes, in these cases we may keep it, but there is an overall increased risk of infection and increased blood loss and transfusions and hospital stays do increase. Regarding anticoagulants, just a few f quick few points. Uh, Dagabatran is a direct thrombin inhibitor. It is the most uh, dreaded or incriminating drug for post-operative ooze, hence use with, uh, with, with extreme vigilance. Apixaban, though we are rampantly using right now, it has been licensed FDA-wise for VTE treatment, not for VTE profile access, though we are still using it. Uh, the treatment or VT profile access, uh, Xeralto is what is recommended or FDA approved and the remaining we can definitely use them. So this is about the NOVAX. Uh, be very careful of, of using direct thrombin inhibitors. 
So next case. So this is my case. Uh, typically these RA patients have got a history of repeated injections in the past and hence I make it a point to send multiple samples during the operative uh, procedure as well. Is that a practice that we follow uh, normally in your practice, Dr. Lundes? Uh, Dr. Mahajan, yeah. I don't unless, uh, see, once in the, in, when I started my practice, initially I was scared of all those dirty visions of stomatoid and came to know there is no point doing anything of those things, just go ahead, clean it and hardly anything happens. So I'm not really doing it unless there's a raw something else which is happening. Right. I think if the patient is clinically and serologically proven rheumatoid, then there is no need no to point. send a sample. Okay. Saying that, if you are operating an osteoarthritic patient and if I see a very red angry synovium, I, I send a sample. We have an international publication also. Almost Perfect. less than 2 or 3 percent of the patients, you will be surprised. You will get a rheumatoid or hypertrophic synovium there. Would you take a sample all, all from the sinus? All osteoarthritis have this typical red uh, thing and yes, it is wise to send. Would you, would you take a sample from the discharge which is coming out through the wound? A swab. There is no point because it is contamination. It is a pure contamination with the skin flora. So That's right. So no swabbing, it is only tissues. I know that first question, sample in each RA case, no, don't no. we think we are dealing with, uh, means our majority of our female patients are seronegative RA? You think they are coming with primary osteo means that question of sample in each RA case, all these young ladies who are coming in at 45 to 55, they won't, no, no, they won't no. have anything. So, Therefore, they are all seronegative immunocompromised. Absolutely okay. agreed with you. It's not for, it's not a u global uh, dictum that we need to send samples. So, that's the take home message. Okay. So, one um, important point is that do not try to take the samples from the discharge because it will, there will be growth of the skin flora or something like that. So, you won't get a true picture of what is the infection inside. Always it's better to take samples from deep structures which we will discuss about a little later. Okay. If at all if you want to take a sample, then wipe out with a normal saline of that wound area, press the knee or press the, you know, wound and see if there is a, you know, fluid which is coming out exuberantly then you can take the sample after cleaning with a normal saline. Yeah, so we move on with the story, then take opinions. Uh, I, I, I rested the patient, uh, gave him a brace, uh, restricted his physiotherapy, stopped with his anticoagulants, uh, but this I started moving in my chair. So day six, post-op, uh, you see this uh, wound, day six evening, and uh, I call him to my office. Okay, uh, so, so this is the, the the question. The next question is that, what will you do now? Day 6, the patient had increased oozing. So, you will do ESR and CRP, change antibiotics, stop knee flexion, watch full expectancy. None of the above. None of the above. Okay. Can stop knee flexion for a day or two. It's not what is, what is the opinion of the house? 10 seconds. So, he is day 6 post-op. You would expect that to go up any which way. And he's early post -op. Okay. So, opinion of the house is to ESR CRP. Okay, we'll go ahead. We'll go ahead. Yes, so we, we go ahead. Can you switch on? Can you switch to the screen? Okay. So, this patient is when I see him. He's actively discharging. He's at this stage given only five doses of typical antibiotics that I give. No prolonged dose of antibiotics. He's not on antibiotics now. He's day six post-op. And this is his ooze. <coughs> Mr. Pradhan, what would be your, your take? So slight different take. Um, we involve our microbiologist on day one. Don't use a tunica at all. We don't use a drain. We do take a sample the first time we see a discharge, which is goes to the microbiology. We cannot, I cannot make a decision on antibiotics. First time that, during index surgery, you mean? No, no. When there is a leaky wound. Okay. That sample gives us an idea of whether there is a secondary bacterial infection that mm -hmm. might set in in the future. We do do an ESR because that gives a baseline ESR for future. It will be raised, but it gives us an idea of what to do, say, on day six. So now you've got a day two discharge. And then you've got a day six discharge. You see a different in, ES, in, in ESR. We don't put them on antibiotics. We, we just, antibiotics cannot be given until you open the wound. Dr. Rajkumar, so, what would be your take also? Yeah, see uh, here, this looks more of a hematoma collection yes. which is coming out. Yes. If you see the swelling, the picture, it does not, so much induration is not there. Perfect. It doesn't look like a frank infection. 
so there is there is a hematoma kind of thing coming out yes so we need to either we that has to come out uh, that has to come out because Perfect. this is not going to stop so this is the situation where without doing much you just give a small wash out clear yes. up all the residual hematomas clotted bloods inside and then clean it up nicely Perfect. this will settle if we don't do that this patient rheumatoid immunocompromised Gets on steroids infected. the chances of infection goes in so this is not infected but the swelling is little huge so perfect so point well taken if you have a serious uh, serosanguinous discharge which is early perioperatively there's an entity called liquefying hematoma and uh, what i did for this patient that's what i expected if you look at his labs his proteins are very low his hemoglobin is low and proteins are basically incriminated. You'll see that very commonly in your CKD patients as well. So if they are low on proteins, they have an entity, they have got a, a hematoma which is liquefying and it keeps on leaching every time. On top of it, we have put in staples which is again contrary to uh, the philosophy of, of, of uh, leaking wounds where we possibly might use uh, sutures. Okay, so in those particular occasions, what would be your choice of... Uh, so before nutrition, Contrary to our belief, ESR and CRP will not give you a diagnosis. So rather, pre-operatively ESR and CRP should have been done. In, in each and every patient of knee or hip arthroplasty, do a ESR and CRP pre-operatively, which will be your baseline ESR and CRP. And it takes about three weeks. You know, after surgery, the ESR and CRP increases because of high in inflammatory markers and it settles down at three weeks' time. And later on, ESR and CRP may be helpful, but not within three weeks' time. But before we move on to, Dr. Londe has got some publications in uh, about CRP. Would you share with the delegates? Actually, I was uh, caught with this type of situation. I think all of us have caught up with this situation. Patient coming back at about four weeks or six weeks, little bit of hot, warm joint, uh, patient complains of some pain, and we do a CRP, and the CRP is high. And then we, I look at the literature. There is one paper from Bob Dunsmore from Scotland, and there were a couple of papers from America. And uh, they were advocating that the CRP has to come down at about six weeks, roughly, after the operation. And unfortunately, there was no Indian literature. So we did a study for unilateral TKR as well as simultaneous bilateral TKR. Simultaneous bilateral TKR, there is no study of CRP anywhere in the world. And in our sample, what we found in a unilateral TKR in Indian patients, the CRP takes almost eight to 10 weeks to come down. And in a simultaneous bilateral TKR patient, Dr. Ravisha was also there in that study, it took almost 14 to 16 weeks for the CRP to come down. And these were not infective patients, you know. So I think probably in Indian population, we have some sort of a pro-inflammatory state or something. And our CRPs are coming down little late as compared to England. As Mr. Pradhan had said, I think it is the trend of the CRP which is most important. You, yeah. know, you do so an index CRP before the operation and after the operation. If the CRP is coming down, you are okay. But if it suddenly shoots up, then probably you are dealing with something. So it is the trend of ESR CRP, you know, which is more important. Let us move ahead after yes. the first case is over. Yeah. So choice of protein intake, typically IV uh, albumin is not a, a go-getter in the immediate perioperatively. Uh, you just increase his oral intake because metabolized proteins are better for healing. So amongst, uh, amongst other factors in nutrition, serum transferrin is giving a lot of value. In those undernourished patients, avoid bilateral procedures and elderly patients definitely have wound healing problems, especially with patients with SLE, de delay or suture removal at around three to three and a half weeks. Uh, so <coughs> we have, uh, I had done a dare for this, not a typical dare, I would rather say a washout for this patient with extensive synovial debridement, poly exchange, no tourniquet was used, lavage, betadine, lavage again, meticulous hemostasis, no drain and incision wound back, high protein diet. We will discuss the steps of dare uh, in Dr. Mohanty's case uh, as we go by. Uh, literature about uh, uh, of VAC, I mean how many of you really use VAC, uh, Dr. Mahajan? Unless there is a skin deficit. Uh, I think if you do a good washout and everything, it should be fine. There's no need for a regular vac. It increases the morbidity, the cost and everything. And patient gets scared, what is this happening now again? It's going to be process. And once you start, you can't stop for a couple of more days. So 
true. I don't think it's required all the time. So just a bit of literature before we move on. Uh, so uh, VAC is coming, especially wound VAC, in your incision VAC, Pico dressings are coming up big time. Uh, and, and they have the uh, mechanism faction of micro deformation by which they draw the wounds closer, micro deformation of facilitating proliferative uh, cell therapy. It removes the fluid and gets you a dry wound. It is not very useful in primary cases because it runs a high risk of blistering. So you need to be very careful and meticulous about where you're placing the sponge. Uh, you need to have uh, a cellophane dressings on the skin. So the, the, the increased risk of blistering is a possibility. But in revision total joint replacement, this is a game changer. That's what uh, we have the literature. It significantly decreases SSI. Again, no growth. No growth again after a wash. Uh, what will be your choice of antibiotics and duration of antibiotics? Uh, if I may ask uh, Mr. Pradhan, uh, Dr. Natesan, if at all. See, uh, but even though there is no growth for this, but uh, some prophylactic antibiotics is preferable. So uh, a basic, like even if you can go ahead with the cefuroxim third generation cephalosporin uh, for five days since the wound, you have opened up, opened and cleaned right. and washed right. up. So that will be, be my choice for five days till the wound settles. And once you are discharging, you can stop the antibiotics. That will be my choice. Perfect. So we always start on tycoplanin and uh, gentamicin. That gives you a 72 hour cover. You take at least five samples when you do your day. And then based on what results you get from that, you can then decide whether you want to continue antibiotics or not. Perfect. So primarily if it's not infected, you want one quick point on immobilization. If we immobilize and the wound is distal, then we elevate and give a Zimmer splint type scenario. Right. If it's in the middle, then that's because your pumping action is there. So we stop range of motion. Perfect. Perfect. Site of discharge. Okay. So this is one week post vac, two weeks sutures removed. Patient is happy. So that's the it's the end of the story. It's now been almost a year and a half. Uh, so far, so good. Fingers crossed. Waiting for his other knee. So we go on to the next case. So before we go into the next case, uh, any questions from the? What is the yes, antibiotic Satish. coverage? Sorry, yeah. Dr. Monty. Just to allow two questions. Antibiotic coverage after two weeks? What, what antibiotics coverage you have given? Okay. So uh, typically for this patient, for the first we had given the Cephalosporin uh, for five, day, five doses. The next we had given um, uh, Magnex Fort, and that is Cephoporazone cell bactum, as well as uh, oral Norflox, uh, because he had got co, uh, co, co, co incumbent uh, uh, UTI as well. So after that had weeks, 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 now what to do? You know, you cannot go ahead with that. You cannot find a focus of infection. So what is the value no, of I that CRP? No, no, that may be high, but that will give you the baseline CRP. But with a CRP of 15, can you go ahead with the primary joint replacement? Yeah, clinically, if the patient is fine, in rheumatoid CRP is high. Ashit, uh, in the inflammatory arthritis, it is high. So diabetics are known to have a high, high, CRP. high CRP. and high. So, so I think you look clinically. What I'm saying is, whatever said and done, what Londa said, even half patients are high CRP post-op. But even the patients are absolutely clean. So if no the patient is clinically fine, what's the use of that CRP? No, no. You should trend. trend. <laughs> yeah. Trend. So we'll so discuss trend, it later on. Trend you Dr. do later on. Whenever Dr. there is a Pachar problem. Dr. comment, then we'll go on to the next case. Okay. Uh -huh. We'll discuss it later on. Uh, regarding the CRP, if it is high, there has to be some cause. Please try to find out. Exactly. Just uh, don't ignore. You have to find out whether these patients are immunocompromised somewhere. Otherwise, no, no, that will not come. Uh, one important thing that you just showed 48 hours culture. Please put an extended culture for this patient. They will grow. More than one third of the patients will grow something. Something. Two weeks. Yeah. 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 Get an extended culture. That is very important. Oral okay. fumbicin for we'll, three weeks is good for We'll, we'll move on. We'll discuss about later on. So, second case a 64 years old female, well controlled diabetic, underwent bilateral ticker three weeks back. One suture site and suture removal of the left knee shows overlapping of the skin margins throwing some serious discharge. Discharge continued in spite of daily dressing. That is the post-operative x-ray and this is how it presented after three weeks. I would open it. Now what to do? Wait and watch x-ray to see for any loosening of the components, ESR, CRP, exploration. I think ESR, CRP, Let, Let's see audience poll. 
just give 10 seconds. Can we switch? Yeah. Switch to Slido. No. Okay. Okay, we have got the poll. Exploration is 80 percent. 80 percent exploration, 20 percent, you know, 86 percent exploration, yes, RCRP 14 percent. Okay, most of them are going for exploration. Yes, uh, Dr. Rajkumar. Uh, this, is, this is totally different from the other uh, wound uh, clinically. So, it is already opened out. The edges are all uh, avascular. It is definitely it needs open out, debridement, secondary suturing, clean it, take a lot of samples. Otherwise, this is not going to heal and it is going to get infected in a big way. So, this is definitely… What is UK experience, uh, Nikhil? I would say the same. I mean, you can't ignore this wound. You have to explore with investigation. Okay. So, all of us agree that it needs exploration. So, increase serious discharge with increased activity, to, uh, exploration in the operating room and ensure deep fossa closure, deep intraoperative cultures. So, this is what is known as DIAR. So, let us discuss about little bit of DIAR which is extremely important. So, Sanjay, uh, what is your take on DIAR? What, what are the… just tell us key steps in the DIAR. I think basically you need to be very aggressive. Whatever looks suspicious you have to remove. Give a thorough wash because the best solution to pollution is dilution. And depending on uh, your philosophy, you may change a hazard plastic. But if I am suspecting a heavily, I mean strongly in the infective part, I think I will change the plastic also. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mahajan? I think five to six samples, all, no tunique whatsoever. No tunique is important. Open up and uh, I would rather change the insert all the time. 99.99, unless it's extremely difficult to dislocate, I would changing the insert and all my day procedures. And rifampicin post-op for three months to avoid biofilm. Okay, so these are the five most important points, you know, steps in dyer. Remember, thorough debridement is the key of success of the dyer. Next, exchange the, you know, mobile part. If it is a monoblock, you know, TBI, of course, you cannot do. But whenever you do a lot of synovectomy and take out everything, joint becomes little lax. You have to exchange the polyethylene. That's why you have to keep, keep all this trial polyethylene you know, thicker polyethylene trial components as well as the original components pertaining to that particular implant. And uh, you have to, you know, curate out at the metal cement interface or cement bone interface because there the granulation tissue, you know, erodes or do, erodes through the bone and causes osteolysis. Send culture and as Dr. Pachare pointed out, you have to do extended culture, tell your microbiologist and you have to send tissue cultures, multiple tissue cultures. and Take all unabsorbed sutures and copious lavas, about six to nine liters of normal cyanide lavas. So these are the steps of the dyer. So do a thorough cyanobectomy. Take out all the cyanobium para from parapatellar gutter, suprapatellar pouch, everything. Then take out the polyethylene so that you reach the posterior aspect of the joint. And as I have shown in the video that you curate out at that interface, that is more important and send multiple tissue samples for culture as well as the histopathology. Why histopathology? It is important in our country for the, to rule out tuberculosis. As well as sometimes fungal infection is there, you may see in the histopathology, in a fungal hypi so that you can do a fungal culture. Get the culture bottles into the theatre and retrieve the samples and put it directly into the culture medium so that you don't waste in the time in the transportation of the samples and tell your microbiologist to do extended culture until about two weeks. Do a thorough lavas. Normally, I use hydrogen peroxide betadine. Some people don't like hydrogen peroxide in the tissues because it's got more of tissue necrosis. And closure should be done with monofilament nylon because that has got least chances of infection compared to staples or, you know, braided sutures. And do you use any adjuvants, Rajkumar, in your uh, dire procedure? In dire, it is not needed uh, actually. Uh, you see, because it is uh, it is more of a non. Uh, um, you are not able to elicit the organism. So here, you need to have a quick debridement and whatever steps you have meant. I don't use beads in the dire procedure. Nikhil, so we don't use anything. Um, we have a low threshold for aspiration and sending it off to microbiology before we do our dare. And uh, if we know the antibiotic, it helps us. So, um, yeah, if there is time, then we would we normally do aspirate. Yeah. There are Rajesh, some reports uh, which shows… Rajesh, you have anything? Just one. No, 
Anything I, to add? Do you use any of this? I, I would not. I mean, at this stage, uh, using uh, the thing is, I, I wouldn't do it. Because you, you essentially, you are trying to save the wound, it's clean, and adding something more into it, which will going to take a long time to absorb, may give rise to more infection. Okay. Goes so, three to six weeks, I would use antibiotic cement. Put the beads in at least. Okay. So, it's, it's your choice. So, one has to do a sufficient irrigation, add antibiotics to the fluid. Use a pulse lavage in low pressure. Don't use it in a high pressure because high pressure would introduce the infection to the depot structures. And anti-biofilm agent, one should use one of these, acetic acid, benzalkonium, chlorhexidine. Nowadays, we are using chlorhexidine in the normal saline, mixed with normal saline because that is considered as an anti-biofilm agent which will take out the biofilm. And local antibiotics, I put calcium sulfate pellets along with antibiotics, but uh, you know, that varies from, as you can see from the panelists, some people don't use it, but I put in the deeper structures like suprapatlar pouch, parapatlar gutters and the posterior aspect of the joint, so that to take care of the local infection. Some people put PMM beads, collagen fleece, all these structures. So this is the same patient, 64 years old female, bilateral sequential ticker. This is a dire procedure done with a, you know, polythene, thicker polyethylene, and the patient is infection free for about four and a half years now. Now that is the function of the patient almost 100 to 110 degree, you know, uh, flexion. Now before you go on to the next case, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir, Dr. Vaidya. Although I came late, I just want to churn some discussion on NGS, next generation sequencing. It says that no wound is sterile. As Pachero was pointing out, first culture, second culture, something will come out of it. And if your microbiosis is good, she will direct you towards a particular antibiotic combination. Okay, thank you. Next generation sequencing is coming, uh, is not available in every city, very few cities in India it is available, so it is just coming into the market. So let's move on to the next case. 69 years old male, diabetic, hypertensive, chronic renal failure, right totally, total knee was done you know, two years back, discharging sinus, anteromedial aspect of the leg, no systemic symptoms, pain, swelling, range of movement, 10 to 100 degrees. So, Sanjay, what is your take on this? I think uh, by definition, Parvezi, discharging sinus at this point is infection unless proved otherwise. So, depending yeah. on your philosophy, one stage or two stage revision. I think in our context, two stage revision. So, all of us would agree there is no big deal about it, that when there is a discharging sinus present, so that will goes to, you know, that goes with the definition of this AOS guideline. The first important point, sinus tract communicating the processes. So it diagnoses infection. Uh, Dr. Unmesh, would you do any investigations at this stage? Of course, uh, basic investigations, of course, CBC, CRP, everything has to be done. Just to make sure we need to trend later on. Uh, there's no point aspirating anything from the joint, it's anyway open. And I think straight away go ahead, culture, five, six cultures and everything, two stage. Uh, apart from that, you might check all this uh, low immunity status issues uh, okay. and fungus. Any, 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 and fungus of, yeah, sure. any of the panelists who do a single stage, one stage? No, uh, no single stage. Definitely it is two stage. But only to quickly add upon the, the clinical picture which you showed. So in this stage, when we are going, better two things. One is not to start any antibiotics in this case. And also if the patient is on any chronic antibiotic, stop it for two to three weeks. Because this is not an uh, emergency situation, stop for two to three weeks, then plan the surgery and take lot of samples and then start on antibiotics. That's and you said he is diabetic. So what is the sugar level and insulin or what is it? Most important That of course, that's the medical part. We need to control the diabetes, that the, the, the other things we are not discussing here. Yeah, Dr. So Branchu, if the… Um, if it's not an immune compromised patient, diabetes under control, yeah. we would… we would aspirate this. If you get a bug, and if the soft tissue envelope is good, then we would consider a one stage, wherein we do the first stage, we actually take a break, we would then re-drape everything, new instruments, and then do the second stage. But yes, if, if it's not immune compromised, we know the bug, then we have a low threshold for going for a one stage. So, so let's move ahead, we have sort of time, so uh, there are the indications of doing single stage, but most of the surgeons in our country, we follow the two stage reconstruction, so we'll just move ahead. And uh, this is the patient, this is, uh, you know, after removal of the component, this is the first stage reconstruction, this is how we prepare our cement spacers and we put it there. 
So this is antibody coated cement spaces along with uh, I put the calcium uh, sulphate pellets there impregnated with antibiotics. That is the X-ray and that is the second stage reconstruction. This is almost you know six years follow up of this uh, patient after two stage reconstruction. Though one stage reconstruction has got a superior functional outcome and uh, you know less of healthcare expense, but uh, it has got a 33.4 percent increased chances of reinfection compared to two states. So we have to weigh your, you know, patient's uh, money and uh, and healthcare cost, everything to do a one stage or two stage. For one stage, at least you should have a trained personnel in your theatre and in your setup. So before uh, we close, let's have a quickly case number four. Yeah. So we have the case four uh, with clear take home messages. Okay. This is a 20 year old male who is now 22 months post op with pain discharging sinuses since eight months after fixation with knee contracture and ankylosed hip. Uh, so this is post implant removal. <clears throat> Immediately post op, you can see signs of infection with thickened uh, cortex irregularity. So indicating that there's osteomyelitis through the canal. And this is now growing MRSA after the, the cultures, after the implant removal. It is sensitive to linozolid, vancomycin, ticoplanin, and the patient was given six weeks of antibiotics. This is 18 months post implant removal. Uh, he has got an ankylosed hip with a flexion deformity at the knee, walks with a limp, no signs of infection. He has discharged his healed. Uh, CBC, ESR, uh, uh, CRP are normal. Uh, what would be your plan? He wishes a good function. I think uh, I would give him a fair chance of hip replacement provided he understands this is high risk of infection. Right. Around 25% chance that he has an infection, one in four or probably something like that, right. is a very possibility of getting infected. So if he takes a chance, right. very good. So we waited for almost 18 months, we did a THR. So day 14 post-op, he throws up with a cerebrulant discharge with fever since two days. His WBC count is 12,000, ESR is 65, CRP is 32. Again, the culture grows MRSA, sensitive to the same kind of drugs. He underwent debridement, vancomycin, stimulant beads at that time. But after this culture grew, he was given IV ticoplanin for eight weeks and oral rifampicin for three months. So Dr. quick one on this. Yeah. So you, did, we would have screened the patient for MRSA before the second stage pre-op? Yes, the, so he was yeah. all clean. He was aspirated. He was clean that then. was negative. And you had a bug which you knew, so we would have put him on antibiotics for yes. three months post op. Yes. Uh, After the first implant removal, yes, we knew no. the bug. We did After allow the it. total hip, we would have put him on the same antibiotics. For As per the culture pattern, yeah. No, for three months post op, irrespective. Okay, okay. Now, I, uh, looking at the, the this one that I was about to tell, see, it's almost like fused uh, hip yes, there. Yes, a fused hip. Young, young chap. Intramedullary osteomyelitis, 18 months is not too uh, good time to go ahead and do a THR. I will wait. In fact, I will wait for some more time because osteomyelitis proven intramedullary, it is high chance of infection. Good point. So I would not uh, do a THR. Good, good take home point. That is why, remember this intramedullary infection, what Dr. Rajkumar is mentioning is extremely important. That's how it leads to recurrence of infection. So while doing total hip replacement, I would put intramedullary stimulant along with, you know, vancomycin, etc., so that, you know, less chances of infection at least, whether go for a first stage or a second stage. So, Please intramedullary drug absolutely. delivery system in the medullary canal is important and know the bug. MRSA is the worst bug that you can find because it is just persistent as far as infection goes. So, this is three months post-op, patient is walking comfortably, he has well-fixed implants, but still he has got an on and off discharge. This is nine months post-op, still on and off discharge. Again. Uh, MRSA, sensitive to linozolid, vancomycin, ticoplanin with well-fixed implants. So what do you do uh, with a patient who is throwing up discharge almost nine months after the surgery with an MRSA proven with well-fixed implants? Okay, so one, one quick thing here that we would have used a cemented implant in this case and use antibiotic loaded cement. Right. That's the endoclinic. So right now, what you debridement, retain the components, two-stage revision, excision orthoplasty, watch full expectancy. Okay, so uh, a quick review, there is no proof of eradication of infection in most of these cases, uh, be sure of that. It's worthwhile to wait at least for two years before you complete uh, the second stage or a definitive procedure. Uh, when we have MRSA, even a DARE procedure is likely to fail. 
Not including rifampicin is the biggest mistake with MRSA. So always use rifampicin. Always use two antibiotics at least. Rifampicin with quinolones is, has the highest success rate. We can use linozolid, but bear in mind the renal toxicity and daptomycin is definitely promising. So before we conclude, uh, let's have one or two questions. Regarding the antibiotics, you know, though rifampicin and quinolones, these are the two antibiotics which are effective against the biofilm. But uh, in our country, at least we keep rifampicin as a reserve antibiotics because of, you know, development of resistance, because our country, you know, patients are more prone to tuberculosis and all. We don't want to develop a rifampicin resistance among the community. So I prefer to use quinolones, which is, you know, better tolerated, oral form is available. That's why quinolone is preferable than rifampicin uh, in these cases. One or two questions. Yes, Satish, you wanted to ask something. One second. Satish. question there is no fixed time limit but at least 18 looks little shorter like you wait for a couple of years like two years three years because his hip is already fused so 18 months if radiologically the intramedullary infection has not progressed all the markers are quiet i think that is long enough to wait for us no one in four chance of infection you have to understand that but part will that reduce he, by he, waiting 24 months yeah at least the, you are safer no nah, like yeah the chances okay we have to we have to close the session just a short comment yeah uh, just, I want to ask one question. What should you do or what is mandatory before you do the hip replacement? Would it not be prudent to sort of check intramedullary sampling? Get MRI, get MRI of the hip, MRI of the shaft. Yeah, the whole MRI thing. will give us an indication of bone marrow edema. Because we'll, discuss, we'll discuss about it later. Uh, also, they used to say in the past five years post-infection settling. You should wait. I would agree with Rajkumar that's Kumar a difficulty that in a low, situation when there are resistant organisms. You could do an MR, an MR, or you could do a spec scan. So be, let us, before we close, take home messages. First thing is that the time to dryness of the wound after a joint replacement depends on the known length, body mass index, estimated volume of blood in dissected tissues, and length of hospital stay. It is not associated with duration of surgery or ASA grade of the patient. Second thing is systemic comorbidities affects the healing. For diabetics, the perioperative euglycemia is extremely important. At least on the first postoperative day, if your sugar or uh, HGT level is less than 140, then very unlikely the patient is going to develop a wound discharge. Rheumatoid disease, renal liver disease, corticosteroid medication, poor nutrition, your pre-op serum albumin level should be more than 3.5 and serum transferrin should be more than 200. That should be the level. Otherwise, you improve it. HIV patients, CD4 count should be more than 200. And one should ideally quit smoking before joint replacement surgery. The third is that if there's a superficial serous discharge, there are thin serous sanguinous discharge, one need to take local wound care, immobilize this patient, avoid knee flexion. If there's a superficial infection, thin serous sanguinous with cellulitis, do a operative debridement, give antibiotics. Sometimes, you know, suture, material also, stitch abscess, we are told on a stitch abscess. If there is deep serous discharge, thicker serous sanguinous discharge, do a operative debridement, do a proper facial closure, what is known as a dire procedure. But if there is a deep infection, thicker purulent discharge, you have to do a operative debridement, antibiotics and do a two-stage reconstruction. I thank you all of you for attending this session. We thank all our panelists and chairpersons and we close the session and hand over to the organizers. Thank you very much. Uh, while they take the photograph, please hang on for a very interesting session. I would like now like to call our chairperson, uh, Dr. Nitin Mahajan, to chair the next session. So, audience, we really want to know whether uh, a good bipolar hemiarthroplasty will give us as good functions as a hip surgeon. That will know, sir. <laughs>